Hey guys, my name is Giovanni Cairo. I play Thaddeus on The Chosen. And my name is Jordan Ross. I play Little James on The Chosen. Dive deeper into the series and follow The Chosen wherever you get your podcast. And on the Hope 1032 YouTube channel. Hey, I'm Ben. And I'm Laura. And this is Following The Chosen. Laura, this is episode two because we're in season four and we're talking about episode two. You just make it so confusing. This I, is... <laughs> I was really trying to simplify and I can simplify even more by diving straight yeah. into it and saying that I loved the opening shot of this episode. I think it is the most cinematic mm. The Chosen has done, like ever. And they've done some good tracking shots and that sort of stuff in the past. Yeah. But this one, this shot for me was basically the reason that it was in the cinema. Everything Absolutely. else, eh, it's like watching TV up on the big screen in, in a good way. Yeah. But this opening shot of Jesus from a distance, it's like a cool indie movie. Like mm. Jesus from a distance alone setting up him in his grief at what happened with John the Baptist in episode mm. one, but also the weight of what's coming. Well, it's a wilderness moment, isn't it? A, you know? Yes. And Great what way to gonna, put it. What are they going to do with that? And you're right. It's absolutely the most cinematic part because when I watched these in cinemas and someone asked me later, do you need to see it in the movies? Was it different seeing it in the movies because you're watching a TV show on the big screen? It took me a second to go, oh, yeah, because they Unlike in season three with the feeding of the 5,000 and walking on water and all of that, we haven't got to what those moments might be in this season just yet. But I thought, oh, no, I don't know. Like, what were the big moments? There's not and really absolutely, blockbuster moments. Not yet. But that scene, Jesus in the kind of open wilderness, absolutely was the one where I went, hang on a minute. Of course, yes, that scene is the reason, among a few others, why they decided to do this on the big screen. Which, for me, uh, introduced a really strong episode with a lot going on. And it had already it'd been set up that way with what came before. It and this mm. is the immediate aftermath of the beheading of John the Baptist. I should back up and spoiler alert, it's too late now. No, you, if, you you've read, know. if you've read the Gospels, you know, you know, it's been known for centuries that he, he got and beheaded. And if you're following the chosen, you've probably watched the chosen, yeah. so we assume okay. This. I'll move on like they attempt to do, but there's a, a lot of discussion early on about um, the rituals of grief mm. in, the, in the Jewish community and then how that leads Jew Jesus to do something reasonably radical it seems and go on the road mm. take the disciples with him for seven days of shiva where they get to is a particularly important place not only geographically but also for anyone who knows what happens in the gospels at a moment where jesus asks his disciples who people think that he is mm. you get that conversation but then laura you get stacks of other ones which i've been meaning to go back to my bible and see are all of these in the same place or not because mm. a lot of things happen in this episode that are quite key about who Jesus is, what he's come to do, and the yeah. impact of that. And one of the things The Chosen has always done well from my perspective is place these moments that we see within scripture, whether it is the famous conversation of who do you say that I am, others like of that nature, it places them in a kind of before and after moment that allows you to connect the pieces together. So later in this episode, there's a conversation around forgiveness that Jesus brings up the whole, you know, 70 times seven, right? Like, you know, just forgive someone seven times, you've got to forgive them 70 times seven. And how this is isn't a uh, um, literal interpretation. Like he's not saying this is the exact number of times That's to right. forgive, but he's making a point. This is an indication of infinite forgiveness. Absolutely. But you see a kind of not just that moment as it happened, but you see a conversation that happened before Jesus sets up the explanation of forgiveness and something that happens afterwards. And this episode has done that so well in so many occasions for me, you know, like I thought that was one of the things that this episode did beautifully because it really like brought to life these scriptural transactions. Transactions is maybe too harsh a word to say, it's scripture, <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like these exchanges, these exchanges within scripture, it just brought them to life where I thought I, and I feel them so much more because I've been able to catch the emotion and context of the character that spoke them and that they affected before Jesus says something that we've seen or heard so many times. Let's circle back to the forgiveness bit. But before we do, um, back to earlier in the episode where Jesus says a whole bunch of things that if you were the disciples and you're hearing this for the first time, it's another occasion where your mind's being blown by what Jesus is talking about. And one of them is um, upon this rock, I will build my church, mm. indicating towards Simon, the disciple, that he's the rock now called Peter. That's a moment in scripture that has been not just well-known and well-remembered, but also mm. controversial. And I think that the handling of it up on screen 
screen was quite good. You could see that those writing this are thinking through how people respond to hearing about the church and upon what it will be built. Mm. I thought they did a good job of trying to negotiate, navigate that terrain. And then out of that too, you get the teaching upon uh, Je- of, of Jesus about if you leave father, mother, whoever you leave your life behind, what you will gain, but also what you will lose or what the cost of that is. All of that in a couple of minutes up on screen. Yeah. And like you, I also felt a bit more pulse in it. I can read it in the Bible and like try to mull it over and that sort of mm. thing. But actually seeing Jesus, Jonathan Rumi pre- yeah. performing this mm. and the other cast responding like you, yeah. like it started to like eat into me a little bit well, about the magnitude of what's going on here. Yeah, because I think you see it. The, that that conversation where Jesus is asking them all, who do you say that I am and, well, you're the one I'm going to build my church upon, comes because of this debate back and forth about uh, like the relationship between Jesus and John the Baptist and all this sort of speculation and chatter that the disciples had kind of come out of to then be with Jesus in this exchange. And Simon, now Peter, was the one that was able to say, you know, like they all say this, but we say this is who you are. And Jesus goes, well, you know, you're the one I'll build my church on then. And it was in in one, one way of looking at it is that Jesus is saying, someone who really understands who I am, that's who I can build my church on. But then the disciples interpret it as to be this moment where Jesus has just elevated Simon Peter above the others and gone, oh, you've kind of singled out one of your disciples now as being the most important or the one that you're going to, you know, sort of trust to lead and build. And that then sparks the conversations that we've seen in scripture before where you've got the sons of thunder, John and James, asking, who does Jesus, you know, think we are? Which of us is the most important? And that little kind of dialogue that then frames part of this episode later about who is Jesus' favourite. For me, this... I sort of was able to piece the pieces together as to why they would have found themselves having that conversation because they've just seen Peter elevated and they don't really, they haven't clocked to what Jesus' true intention might have been in doing that. That's another example of the screenwriters, the team behind The Chosen, plundering, if that's the right word, that's not the right word, crafting from God's word different elements back into these storylines. And Mm. I also really enjoyed how this conversation between John and James, if that's the right word, debate, discussion, annoyance, anger about (laughs) about Jesus' elevation of one disciple and where that places them Mm. as a really good way of getting all these threads of scripture together and displaying some of the human element that must have been going on among yeah. the disciples, let alone other followers of Jesus. Well, but even his closest the... followers yeah. would have been having this wrestle. Mm. And it's not like Jesus said this stuff in a vacuum. Like this church will be built upon this rock and then walked away and then they all went away happy. Like they would have had a response to this. Yeah, and that theme of their human side is massive in the first episode and this second episode of season four. There's constant... Uh, moments where they say we're only human I'm only human I'm human and I'm human etc there's constant references to the humanity of these characters and I think that was to me it was something that was well worth noting because that's that's true for all of us we're humans with a level of divine experience right or wanting to connect in some respect to Jesus to uh, a sense of divinity and so where's the place for humanity alongside of that and even in the conversations that James and John do have about who is Jesus favorite what I liked is that they're done in these really like those two characters bring a bit of the fun and the lightheartedness. I think sometimes when we read scripture we can feel like it's all very like now let's pause and kind of deliberate about this and it feels so serious and reflective but the way the conversations are portrayed on screen is like we're walking down the road and we're having a chat and who does this say and what do you think and I reckon I'd be the favorite and it's very like the way that we are in our kind of casual conversations they put that up on screen as a way for you to almost see how even in the is just day-to-day moments we can find ourselves thinking things getting a little off track talking about stuff that isn't necessarily you know bringing us closer to God or like it's these simple conversations where we're losing a bit of clarity and I think they did that really well like they talk about big stuff but they do it in these kind of casual relatable ways that makes you see it for what it really is and even Jesus was joking at the start of the episode with Andrew during their grief period and I mean, some people might take that as sacrilegious or like Jesus never joked, but I just don't think that's true. Like, it's not like Jesus would never have laughed and Mm. he went and hung out with people in all sorts of situations. It's not like he didn't have a sense of humor. It's not like God doesn't have a sense of humor. Mm. So that's a good illustration, I think, in this episode of the chosen team recognizing that 
and bringing that in in a very relatable and understandable way. Yeah. Forgiveness has come up heaps of times in The Chosen before, hasn't it? Like I was trying to think of different examples of it. Mary Magdalene came to mind. Was it in season two or season three? But what happens in this episode, episode two of season four, was one of the most powerful forgiveness moments for me out of The Chosen. Was that Mm. the same for you? It felt like it's almost like we haven't talked about forgiveness and here we are. Well, this is the forgiveness moment between Matthew and Simon Peter because Matthew's character, the tax collector, he was, if you remember back to season one, and I think it's part of season two, they all blur a little bit together, I'll be honest, but he was um, one of the people that was really putting pressure on Simon Peter. It was really like, it was it was Simon Peter's actions that Ma- uh, Matthew was kind of critical of and he could have ended up in prison and all of this kind of stuff before uh, Simon Peter starts to follow Jesus. And even though Matthew becomes a disciple, that is never addressed. Like, hey, I could have been the one that ended up making you, you know, get in trouble with the government. You could have gone yeah. to jail because not of me. Not only did I turn against all of our people and my own family for money, but yeah. it was going to affect you and your family's livelihood yeah. and I almost got you tossed in jail. G'day, mate. We're and disciples. Yeah, we're now shoulder to shoulder behind Jesus. And so there's this moment where Matthew realises oh, I think because of something Jesus has taught, I now need to address this. But how do I address this? And do I have to? And, you know, what are the parts of this that is uh, Simon's responsibility? What Jesus says to Matthew is really powerful. But I think, too, when Matthew is able to go to Simon Peter and ask for forgiveness, and then a few bits later, because Simon Peter's not quite ready to forgive in that moment, how he then responds back to him. So powerful. And one of the lines that stood out to me if I, you know, sum it up, is that Jesus says that when we apologize, that is us asking for repentance and that forgiveness is the gift the other person gives to you. Like you're not, because Matthew was concerned that he wouldn't get forgiveness and what's the point? He's going to hate me anyway, all of this sort of stuff. And it's like, we're not responsible for the forgiveness. We're responsible for asking for the apology when we're the one that's done wrong, because that's us being obedient to repenting. And then on the flip side, forgiveness becomes the responsibility of the person who's wronged, but it's their gift to give. Like they are the one who can give it or not give it. And you can see that wrestle in Simon Peter on screen. I was almost tearing up throughout all of it and then in the um, ultimate exchange between Matthew and Simon Peter the way that Jesus in the chosen handles both situations Mm. and talks about the distinctions on both sides of who is coming and and, um, asking for who is apologizing and even seeking forgiveness or hoping for forgiveness but can't force it yeah and then the the person on the other side who's being apologized to and what and their response and their gift they might give Mm. and particularly in simon peter does a great job of demonstrating how so many people probably yourself and myself included can feel if you have been wronged and you know you've been wronged and the person says they're sorry wholeheartedly yeah but how that can almost annoy you about yeah. forgiveness. Like, okay, now the expectation is on me to forgive. Yeah. And the, this episode is a really good teaching case, I think, a mm. lesson, I think, in sitting down and thinking through the complexities of forgiveness. Yeah. But also why you would, based on God's love in Jesus given to us and why you would, would want to share that gift, that it's not yeah. a, a heaping a weight upon you that you have to do it. It's more challenging you to think about why you would not. Yeah, and it's not easy. Like they don't say forgiveness is easy or that asking for an apology is easy, but it's just, uh, as you've said, a really good example of why, like why from both sides the act of apology and forgiveness is so important. But then, of course, too, It is a setup within the context of this series for who Jesus is and ultimately the gift of forgiveness that he extends to everyone and anyone, right? Like that's part of what I feel like these little moments are leading up to is helping us get a better understanding of the higher level concept of forgiveness within the Christian faith. On that note, Laura, I am looking forward to episode three and talking with you about episode three of The Chosen. This is following The Chosen. We hope you are following The Chosen already already join us on youtube drop some comments our way we would love to interact with you get back to you about your thoughts on this episode the last episode the last season send us a comment we'll get back to you in an upcoming episode if you're joining us via podcast hello make sure you subscribe spotify apple hopepodcast.com.au basically laura wherever you grab your podcast everywhere all over the shop you can follow us as we follow the chosen following jesus yeah does that yes. sound right? Yes, it, it did. It did. <laughs> I made things more complicated at the start. You just made them more simple. Thanks for joining us on Following the Chosen. We'll see you next time.
Hi, my name is Vanessa Bonavente and I play Mary Mother in The Chosen. Dive deeper into the series and follow The Chosen on Hope Media Podcasts and on the Hope 1032 YouTube channel.